Greetings, one and all. It's Gareth here with the Somewhere on Earth podcast, and it's Tuesday, the 19th of March, 2024. We have voices from Senegal and Mozambique, and we'll see what else we can put together for you. Definitely plenty of action going on here in the studio in London. And uh, with us for some experting today, it's, it's Anya Litorovich, this side of the glass again. Now, this is turning into a habit. What's your excuse this time? Well, I liked it last time, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> you did, actually. I, I did. You did well. I think you suited you. Oh, gosh, that's so kind of you to say I did well. <laughs> be sucking up to the boss gets you everywhere, doesn't it? Exactly. Well, you know, I might like it so much, you know, I could stay here. Hashtag That's, just saying. Okay. I'm just, look, I've got Gillen on speed dial here. Where is she? Right. Okay. Well, th- this is very nice, Anya. I'm glad you're this side of the glass. And uh, we've got plenty to chat about on the serious side of things as well. So let's uh, get into the podcast. And coming up. We have the very bright student in Senegal who's doing a whole lot of work with AI and big data. One of her projects is tackling malaria in Senegal. And speaking of top talent, Africa has a young, dynamic workforce. But are there the jobs and opportunities to match? That's all right here on the Somewhere on Earth podcast. So let's start with the inspirational young computing student and data science fan whose adventures in science and computing began in earnest when her mother told her to get off the games console and actually do something. And Rokhaya Dianye really has done something, quite a few things. She's Senegalese and she's gone into a number of internships after joining the Dakar American University of Science and Technology as a student. Rokhaya is working on various important projects, including using AI to help tackle malaria in Senegal. Oh, and a quick bit of backstory here before we hear the main interview. It took producer Anya, well, you'll tell us about this, Anya. It took, took you quite a few goes to get this set up, didn't it? It did. Did. I mean, she appeared in a uh, in a very big article in the New York Times, and obviously, you know, keen interest. Uh, Nana before actually our, our backer uh, saw it and said, "We must talk to this amazing young woman." Uh, this amazing young woman was not really contactable, though, uh, <laughs> or neither was her university. Now, to be fair, there were things going on in Senegal. Uh, so there were three internet suspensions in the last nine months. There's been political uncertainty in the country since uh, June 23, when an opposition leader, Usmane Song. I think that's how you pronounce his name, was arrested. Other opposition leaders were arrested. Some were attacked by the police. Uh, There were meant to be presidential elections on the 25th of February, uh, but they were postponed by the outgoing president. Um, The Senegal Constitutional Council did actually say this, actually, no, we're going to go ahead with them as soon as we can. Uh, So it was really difficult to get hold of Rokhaya. We were speaking, we were writing to each other in French (laughs) via LinkedIn. That, that That all worked brilliantly. And then you remember the the interview that we did with her it was really difficult to get a time because yep. of the shutdowns it was really difficult to actually hear her because it was you know the connection was uh, was wasn't great and it kept falling right. over didn't it okay yeah <laughs> So apart from everyone queuing up to talk to this uh, incredible young woman and then political turmoil in her country and the internet popping in and out and then my availability and her availability. and uh, Anyway, we got there in the end. So it's a bit of a backstory. We like to explain these things to you. So basically just really pleased that we got this. Now, I will say there is a bit of interference on the sound on this interview, but I hope now that you've heard the story of how we just got the audio at all, you'll just be... Um, that you'll be kind about um, just how the audio has come out. But you can hear Rakai absolutely fine. She's brilliant, as you'll hear. So let's carry on with her story and her work. And uh, the conversation starts with um, AI and big data. We realised at some point that one of the most significant challenges in Senegal, it's just everywhere. You would just realise that you got diseases around. But... Access to timely and accurate healthcare diagnosis, particularly in rural areas, was the main problem. So in a lot of areas in my country or in other countries in Africa, people do not have very skilled people everywhere they want. Like we have very talented people, but unfortunately we don't have a lot of them. Like there are not that many, which means that some people will find themselves in areas where they will not 
be able to have that expertise. Right, sure. And so when you're lacking that kind of expertise, I guess technology has to be at least part of countering that. And you're talking about AI here. So what kind of health conditions and diseases are you interested in diagnosing using a, an AI approach? The first disease I started with was tuberculosis with uh, a group of friends. But then I realized that we didn't have that much data. The reason why we choose AI here is like a transformative solution because it enhances like diagnosis accuracy and speed. But then it allows us to be able to save, like to potentially save lives through early detection and treatment. And with the use of AI, we would be able to analyze a huge amount of data from a lot of things that we can have around. Is, is there a way that you can bring in existing tools from outside Senegal, or is this really the, the, a very specific Senegalese use case that really nobody's designed a tool around it, and even if they had, it wouldn't be based on data in Senegal that uh, pertains to populations there? So it really sounds as if you're tackling something that where there isn't the data, there aren't the tools. Are you kind of starting from scratch? Well, yes. Uh, what we're doing is mainly like, um, you know that we have some tools that we could rely on, but those tools are not really available everywhere. Like in some areas you would go to Senegal, you would just not find any microscope. Or if you do find some microscope, those microscopes are not, you know, it's um, it's very cheap microscope. So it's not high quality microscope that will allow those people um, to be able to provide some, you know, very good high quality diagnosis. So what would happen is, would be the fact that you can either find microscopes, but not people that are trained to be able to go through some those microscopes and perform the analysis because they don't have enough people to bring them uh, on those areas. Or you don't even find a microscope. So you can have trained people, but not with the necessary tools to be able to provide accurate diagnosis. That's why actually in, my, in my, our case, we, with my university, we decided to work on malaria to help um, people or labs that are, or structures because in some areas you don't even have labs. Those structures are not well equipped. So when you talk about these images, are you talking about, say, the bacteria with tuberculosis or is it the parasites with malaria? What are you actually looking at? Our main focus right now is malaria because we are working on it with uh, my university. It's a collaboration between my university and a lab in Senegal, which is called IRESA. So they are the one providing us data, and um, what they give us is um, microscopic slides that are slides that are already prepared and fixed. So all we do is just use those slides and you know collect our own data sets to make to make sure that it works with um, the type of microscopy that we are using in this case, and then um, that will allow us to actually have our own data sets of images, and then those images will be used. Um, to train our AI model just to make sure that um, the algorithm can accurately identify malaria-infected cells from blood samples. So I think, you know, the process was challenging, of course, but um, I think it's rewarding because it, it, it promises to, to develop malaria diagnosis um, significantly, especially in our areas. What your research is all about then is better training the AI models. So you're training the AI, that's one step, but now it needs to be useful out in the field. So how will that help with diagnostics, especially in some of the remoter areas of Senegal? So actually what we're providing is a platform that you, uh, where you know lab technicians can just go and connect to the platform and then from the microscopic slides that they're having, they could just put it on the microscope that they will connect to the computer, and then from there, they will be able to, um, the AI model will be able to tell what's on this on the slide if we have a case of infection and the level of infection and all the information that are necessary. And that, the use of the platform goes beyond that because it will allow to our governments to have a better tracking of um malaria cases in Senegal because that platform can help our governments have a better, you know, better understanding and, you know, have um, maybe in time 
they can have those results. There you go. That is Rokhaya Dianya speaking to us there from Senegal in the midst of uh, all kinds of upheaval in that country. And um, the internet went down several times during that interview as well. But, uh, or did it on that one? It did. It did, yeah. It uh, went down on that interview as well. So, um, Anya, back here in the studio. Um, so, we talked there in the introduction about quite a lot about what's been going on in Senegal. You brought us up to speed with that. But listening back on that interview, what really strikes me is this real kind of the role of big data and AI. And this being very much Rakaya saying that, to, no, I'm just putting words in her mouth here, but you know, I think she's effectively saying that, Yes, there's all kinds of technology out there. There's lots of data. There is training data for these models, but not all of it is going to be relevant to the setting that she's in. And I mean, you've been a health correspondent, so you know all about the issues of diagnosing or screening for the likes of malaria or TB. I think she put it so well herself that you either get you know the limited number of skilled people uh, or you get the equipment to be able to identify if a sample has malaria. And the AI tools that she's developing really are, are, are looking uh, overcoming that and that what that will allow for governments and even local health clinics to do is to plan you know to know how many cases or roughly how many cases there are of malaria in Senegal until they know uh, it's very difficult to decide well where should mosquito nets go Mm. for instance. I think what's really important here with big data, well, any type of data, is if you put rubbish in, you get rubbish out. The data quality has to be really good. And that's one thing that I think Rokhaya is really, really pushing for. With good data, you're going to be able to have good analysis. With good analysis, you're going to then have good planning. Yeah, I mean, that is so important, Anya. Thank you for that. Well, there is more from Rakaya in the uh, extended in the podcast extra version and the subscription version. And it's well worth a listen because... Out of all things, we ended up talking about underwater drones and seagrass. Figure that one out. So that's in the podcast extra. It's pre-record Gareth here, interrupting the live Gareth with an important message. Yeah, they're just playing this in to give me a rest, aren't they clever? And the message is, please subscribe to the extended version of this podcast, won't you? It's where the guests often relax. I get to wing it a bit and we find out more about people's work and their lives. It's 10 US dollars a month. Most podcatchers open up the subscription content if you just click on the padlock or something. And or you can go to somewhereonearth.co, press the big button button on the left hand side to subscribe or the big button on the right to donate you can opt out at any time and because we know it's so easy to cancel we really do try to make it good no filler just a bit of extra bonus content to make your and our day All right, so we heard that at the beginning from Rokhaya in Senegal and it really struck me listening to her story about her talent, how valuable that is, the journey she's had with her education. She's been through a couple of universities, studied biology to start with, and now is ending up in computing, in big data and AI. And uh, it had all of us on the team thinking about kind of zooming out from Rakaya's case there into the bigger picture around talent in Africa. And we're always hearing about how the great continent of Africa just has this young workforce a, a dynamic workforce and that's great but what are the kind of roadblocks then in terms of taking that really harnessing and leveraging that workforce well one of the people we go to in these situations because he always has fascinating things to say on this kind of topic is Bhaskar Chakravorty he's dean of global business at Tufts University in the United States you may have heard him on the podcast a few weeks ago and um, he's also the chair of a research initiative called Digital Planet and that explores the impact of digital innovations around the world and he has a loads of data at his fingertips about a lot of these questions, including the whole you know, workforce across the continent of Africa question. And this is what he had to say. Africa is um, 
one of the youngest regions in the world, highly uh, challenged on so many fronts, most significantly on the economic front. And when I say Africa, we're talking about 54 plus countries. And of course, uh, every region, every country in Africa has its own challenges. Uh, but uh, the youthful demographic is, uh, is a fairly universal phenomenon uh, across the continent. One of the biggest difficulties in Africa is uh, getting meaningful, productive jobs, you know, for this, uh, this very young population. But prior to giving them jobs, uh, we also need to make sure that they have uh, education and the skills necessary to have uh, productive lives. So Africa is uh, it has a, a number of distinctive challenges, uh, but this is a potential uh, opportunity for the continent to turn a few things around uh, and, and utilize this, this youthful dem- demographic. And this is a population that has also taken to digital technologies you know, quite uh, wholeheartedly, and uh, the penetration of the mobile phone has been not at the same pace as the rest of the world, but it's definitely picked up quite a bit over the last uh, you know, five to seven years. And the young people are uh, generally, especially in the urban areas, much more digitally enabled than, uh, than one would have expected. Uh, one point that comes out from your research is a kind of good news, bad news story in a way. You know, So the good news is that you have the skills. Uh, the equally good news is that, that you have the um, jobs and the need for these skills. Um, the bad news is they're just all in the wrong place. They're mismatched. <laughs> so the job seekers are not where the jobs are. But is or can technology be helping with that, you know, working online, that kind of thing? They definitely can. If you just think about um, the need for... Uh, people to uh, be able to do relatively simple coding work or relatively uh, you know, basic, uh, repetitive back office work. And, and of course, you know, a lot of that work has historically been done in countries like India, the Philippines, and other parts of the developing world. Uh, but there continues to be need for different levels of skills in, uh, in, in, in basic services uh, that can be delivered over the internet system. So if we can get the young people uh, in many parts of Africa sufficiently skilled to be able to sort of occupy, you know, these, uh, these roles, there is a potential for them to be able to use this technology and uh, become productive members. Uh, a second uh, uh, use of this technology is for them to use uh, their phones as a way to run businesses. And you know, sometimes those businesses are, you know, home delivery or those businesses are delivering flowers or, 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 or repair uh, businesses. So there are lots of you know, small and medium enterprises that can be built on top of essentially access to a mobile phone. But that requires the uh, ability to organize, the requires some skills, and uh, uh, sort of creating uh, this ecosystem of uh, informal service uh, services that we are beginning to see in many parts of the continent, uh, but that needs to be scaled up. And another important part of uh, the use of the phone is being able to be paid on the phone. So you deliver a service and in return you get paid and that payment comes through over the phone in some parts of Africa that's much further along and places like Kenya of course is well known. But there are other parts of Africa such as Nigeria for instance is somewhat further behind in terms of using mobile payments as as frequently as you see on the eastern side. That's Bhaskar Chakravorty. I didn't know about that fact that um Nigeria is a bit further behind when it comes to um, mobile phone payments because uh, you know, well, just about anybody listening to this across the continent of Africa will know all about M-Pesa. We've certainly used it. We, we have. We haven't done anything, can you? Oh my God, it's so useful. <laughs> Amazing stuff. And um, I, it's just really good just to get that um, check-in, isn't it, from Baskar, who's always got that data at his fingertips and he'll give you a narrative about skills and maybe the mismatch between the skills and the opportunities and potentially some of the solutions so what strikes you when you listen to back to that interview i always keep having to remind myself that 70 percent of the population is in africa is under 30 i mean it's it just is in, incomprehensible to me and i really struggle to kind of keep remembering about that and that these people really need to be skilled 
There was a survey recently in the UK that, that showed that parents are just bewildered as to what careers their children can do. It's not as simple as doctor, lawyer, plumber, electrician, or, or what have you, teacher, um, because they don't know what jobs are out there. I mean, even young people will struggle to know what jobs they might be doing in the future because they haven't been invented yet. So really to try and do that for such a huge amount of the population is difficult, obviously, but they need to have the basic IT skills there. Yeah. And that whole point about African solutions for African problems as well, I suppose. Exactly. I mean, it has to be Africans for Africa. What would happen if uh, multinationals, and some of them are doing this, uh, come in, they create their own data, they gather their own data. And what happens if then this is used to create some algorithms that, that will then be used? Who owns that data? Discuss. If, like Rock Hire, is gathering and using her skills to get the local data they're going to have ownership over it. And I think that is incredibly important for Africa going forward. We'll be back after a quick break. AI is changing the game of business. Will you be on the winning team? I'm Jordan Wilson, the host of the Everyday AI podcast and your coach to help you learn the X's and O's of AI. Artificial intelligence isn't just a new player in the game, it's a new sport altogether. So if you don't quickly put AI into play, your competitors will run up the score. I've spent my whole life building winning teams from coaching basketball to working with big players like Nike and Jordan brand. My next move, helping you win with everyday AI. Listen, wherever you get your podcasts or on everyday AI podcast.com. Let's tap into AI together and put points on the board. Yeah. Data ownership. And the other thing behind that phrase, African Solutions for African Problems, is remembering that Africa is a vast continent of many countries. And what this is really about is country-specific solutions, as if there's, you know, the, the myth that there's some solution like that's going to fix Africa any more than anything is going to fix Europe or the United States. It's probably a bit different because that's a country, but you know what I mean, you know, as if thinking of on the country-specific thing that Uganda is not Rwanda, Senegal is not Ghana. Exactly. We can discuss why that is, et cetera, et cetera. But they are different peoples and therefore they need different uh, different solutions to different problems. And I think one thing that I, uh, I recently read about uh, was Nigeria. As everybody thinks, oh my goodness me, Nigeria, every, you know, so many people use the internet. But what most people don't realise is that it's uh, multi-use. So people who do use the internet use it a lot but they will have five devices. So the actual numbers of people using the internet is much smaller. It's just people use it in different ways. Right. Anya, thank you. Just before we leave it for this edition, can we do some subscriber numbers? Yeah, I think we got... Yeah, we got a WhatsApp. We got a WhatsApp from Mozambique. I'm so excited. Mozambique, beautiful country. Yeah, we're very excited. So here we are. It's beautifully self-contained. Here's one of our listeners. Hi there, Martin here from the Dairy Goat Guy from Southern Mozambique. I uh, was a avid follower of the Digital Planet, late adopter of the Somewhere on Earth, but very happy to have found the podcast, enjoying the old familiar voices, and working my way through the catalogue. Thanks very much. Keep up the good work. Very nice too. So I love that, the Goat Guy, <laughs> the Mozambique I'm Goat Guy. That oh, it's brilliant. Mozambique. And well, I love the fact we have a catalogue. <laughs> I, like, I like that as well. And uh, it's, I mean, I'm, whether you're an early or a late adopter, if you're just adopting the podcast, that's uh, thank you. We're very glad that you're here. But he has a very good use of AI, doesn't he? He certainly does in his profile pic, which is two goats. Two goats with cheese and grapes in front of them. <laughs> very importantly, all generated by AI. So... Yeah, it's all very well coming onto this podcast saying about AI and the really big global health problems and so on. Yeah, you know, it's also coming up with goat pictures as well. It's very positive there. Very positive. <laughs> you get both ends of the spectrum on this podcast. Um, although I mentioned listener numbers, he didn't actually ask for one there. So we, we had a listener, but can we do some um, subscriber listener numbers? Well we, as well? well, we can. And I mean, you know, we have to just mention now that we do have some quite... Um, important soap suds numbers now don't we we sure do yes none other jimmy wales and he's got i know and amanda renteria yeah ceo for code for america yes it's certainly made my database here look very like star studded shall we say um so following keenly in their footsteps in their 
number tracks is uh, Adrian, who says, may I claim alpha, the fine structure constant with a value of about 1 over 137? Again, how do you enter that on our database? I might just turn it into a like decimal, naught point, whatever it is. I think you're going to have to. I think to. it's the only way of expressing it. And it's no, I, I could probably write alpha on the database. Let's think about that. But Go on, go on. Anya, you and probably all the listeners uh, must be wondering why Adrian wants that on, number. Okay, well, it's uh, obviously I'd know this kind of stuff. It's related to the strength of electron-electron interactions that cause the separation of lines in the hydrogen spectrum. <laughs> Wikipedia. <laughs> it's very useful for that particular research. Adrian, can he have? Well, can he have that number? Well, I, I, I'm fine with that. Stevie, Stevie. Oh, he's not sure. Stevie might veto it. Uh-huh. This could be our first ever veto of a subscriber number. Uh, uh, Stevie is actually saying, "Go on, then." Got that one through. Whew, that was close. And if you were wondering um, about Jimmy and Amanda, and you thought, "Oh, how did I miss that?" Well, you missed it because it was on the subscription version of the podcast. Yeah, so you can miss all kinds of stuff, I'm afraid, folks. Jess Donaldson wants Soap Sud 2. He says, can I have number two, please, if it hasn't gone? Why? Because Gowry bagged number one, says <laughs> Jess. That's true. No, that's not fair. Gowry did not bag number one. She was anointed with it. Yes, that's an important distinction. Uh, Jess says, if number two isn't available, then could I request the smallest number still available? I mean, will that be something like 0.0000001? 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. I don't even want to go there. So, yes, in other words, you can have two, Jess. Let's just make this simple for ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can we do that, uh, Stevie? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a nod. Stevie says yes. Right, let's give you that one. And how about this one? Uh, let's go down the list slightly just making sure there aren't a few that we've already done uh so corin patterson says i love your podcast i was a long time digital planet and click podcast listener since 2006 i have no idea what listener number i was previously and corin by the way that doesn't matter because we're not carrying them over anyway we're actually it would be illegal under gdpr or something that i've just made up to, to have done that so we are starting from scratch so Corin says, is number 60 available in the new format? So not down to whether you had or didn't have it in the last iteration of whatever this is. It's just to make sure it hasn't already gone. I'm just checking. Um, no. So I'm actually doing a number search here. No, we can give that to you if the committee agree. Is there a reason why? Or just um, does she want it? I, um, I don't think so. I'm trying to remember if it was. No, I don't know what, what it was. So we'll check, but yeah, that's fine by me. We'll just we'll just let her get away with it anyway. And uh, I think Stevie's nodding, so I think that means yes from Stevie. Bernard Hunt wants listener number, subscriber number, suds number twenty six hundred. It's a famous number, says Bernard, from the formative days of phone freaking and computer hacking. The phone network could be controlled by sending a tone with a frequency of two thousand six hundred hertz into the handset, which allowed them to make free calls, especially long distance or overseas. When computers started being networked with remote access via phone lines, hackers connected to computers all over the place. I think I remember that, actually. I'm old enough. Oh, well I, I was never that naughty, so I don't <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't know. I mean, I was never that naughty. I just remember that uh, that tone, that 2600 hertz tone. Uh, so I think that's quite a nice one. In fact, a bit of um, background on that. I Not hacking phones, but back in the old days, when long before people had mobile phones, you could dial a number just by clicking on the, the little cradle stand, you know, the switch, basically, to emulate the numbers that otherwise would be clicked through to through the rotary dial. So you could go ba ba for two and then ba 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 for four. I think that was four. And it was so much fun. And but, but one day my friend Donovan came in and somehow he he'd never told me how, but he had the number for the White House. <laughs> and so and of course, especially if you're doing long distance, you'd have to put loads of coins in to sustain the call. But the phone would let you at least listen to the person the other end, obviously saying hello, White House. So we uh, we rang the White House and just... Uh... Well, bango any attempts to get anything from the US government on the show now, Gareth. Yep. Sorry about that, US government. I know Ronald Reagan was personally very cross about it and clearly the government of the United States has never forgiven us. Um, I could do the other story about how I was actually stopped in um, 
Yeah, passport control going into Houston once. I, I didn't do anything illegal. It's all right. I thought you were going to say Rwanda. Can you remember that? Yeah, gosh, yeah. I think that's enough now. Yeah, I think, well, you're the producer, so that's enough until we've agreed or not agreed whether Bernard can have 2,600. Oh, I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, Steve. Stevie says yes. So a few suds there. Uh, Julie um, granted... What a huge privilege it must be. But uh, we love getting your sud suggestions. So please keep sending them in and we'll keep trying to do this and we'll get through a whole load of them and we'll get you registered. There we are. That is the programme, the podcast for this edition. Anything else to go through, Anya, or do I need to wrap it up? Wrap it up, please. Oh, that's genuinely scary. Right, so... Before we go, quick reminders. The email is hello at somewhereonearth.co. We are on social media. I'm sure you know where by now, but you can usually find us through Somewhere on Earth podcast, the global tech podcast, or an arrangement of those words. And on WhatsApp, we're code 447486 329 484. Audio today has been by the eponymous Stevie Arnoldi at Lanson's Team Farner over here and uh, I think you probably by now know who the producer is so I name check you again Anya Lichterowicz you say it better than me and uh, I'm Gareth thanks for listening and um, see you next time stand by for the subscription if you subscribe